All right. Oh, Good I morning. Don't... Welcome. Welcome at our school. Thank you for coming. Uh, I will just introduce my colleagues, which is Professor Szeleszewski and uh, Eric Buk uh, and <coughs> Maciej Kolanowski and Maciej Ososki, who takes care of the camera. So if you need anything, you can turn to each of us. And let me introduce our first speaker, Professor Roth, Ruth Gover, uh, Gregory, sorry, Ruth Gregory, <laughs> Professor Ruth Gregory, and she will introduce us to black hole theory. <laughs> Thank you. I can see my... Uh, <laughs> my name was, was getting translated into Polish. <laughs> Yeah, so um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me over to give some lectures on black holes. I think that um, I got handed a list of topics which I kind of pruned down to a shorter list, and I think that's still a bit overambitious for the three mornings, but we'll see where we get to. Um, and my aim really is to sort of give part a sort of discussion about various aspects of black holes, but occasionally to take a deep dive into particular topics. So um, I'm not really sure what the audience is working on. Some of the things I'll be saying might be extremely familiar and some things may be completely new, but hopefully it'll at least be of interest, even if it's not directly relevant, to your research. So I always feel it's important to at least try to give, um, I suppose, either tools. I'm a bit sort of one of these relativist toolkit type of people. So that if you want to then go and dig into the literature, you're, it's kind of the door has been opened. Um, and so the, the focus really that I want to talk about on, in these three uh, double lectures is black holes. So I've always been interested, I've always loved black holes, but uh, of course now black holes are no longer this sort of theoretical construct. You know, we're, we're actually out there, we're observing them. They're, they're a sort of reality. And uh, I, this is reflected in the topics in this school this week in Warsaw. You've got a lot of uh, subject matter on gravitational waves, approximation methods, and of course on black holes. So I'm focusing much more towards the analytic, mathematical or theoretical end of black holes. Um, but of course, you know, there's, there's always an eye to thinking about what, you know, what can they tell us. So, you know, for example, modifying gravity. So I'm sure some of the other lectures are going to be uh, saying that. So for today, I'm really going to focus on black hole solutions, sort of more just about, about the exact solutions. And I, I wanted to start off by taking a deep dive into Birkhoff. So the sound is OK, I'm assuming. Um, <clears throat> but I can tell my voice is just a little scratchy. So. And the reason I'm doing a chalk and talk is to try and keep the pacing about right. So here. So I wanted to start off by just giving us a general Birkhoff theorem, in part because when we think about black holes, I think one of the most amazing things about the black hole is that it is, you can write the solution essentially on one line, and yet that little piece of mathematics seems to be exactly what is out there in our universe. And it's, it's normally we're used to making compromises in physics with our mathematical models. But it seems as if the black hole is one of the purest examples of sort of this relation between mathematics and physics. And then the second thing I wanted to say about this generalized Birkhoff theorem is a piece of advice for the younger researchers, which is there's no 
No result too obvious not to write up, I think is, is, is the saying. I always remember uh, talking with Andrew Liddell about the slow roll parameters in inflation. So Andrew Liddell and David Leith introduced these as they were discussing uh, the new inflationary model, or as it was at the time. And of course, these slow roll parameters are now absolutely at the core of how we describe inflationary models, but their paper is not all that well cited. And in essence, if they'd rewritten a second paper, you know, parameterizing slow roll inflation and really just spelling out their, uh, you know, their results, that would have been, you know, they would have got a lot more direct credit. So, sorry, that's just a, a, a sort of small um, vignette. So, th so, the reason being, of course, that in fact the generalized Birkhoff theorem, you can sort of see that in the literature, people coming to it on occasion, doing little bits of it, but never broadcasting it. So, I actually spotted in the Myers and Perry paper on higher dimensional black holes that they also did a, a sort of very restricted general Birkhoff um, where they assumed staticity uh, but vacuum, no lambda, in general dimensions. So in terms of, let me just sort of state what I'm going to prove. Although I've, it's so long since I did my maths degree that I'm sure I won't state it completely rigorously. Sorry, it's getting small there. So here... Shouldn't there be plus minus one and zero? Sorry, that should be kappa, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Hang on. Is there a... Or am I just doing this? I was doing it the wrong way. Okay. So here, this is just the statement that if you, if you say you have this large symmetry, SO D minus two or it's... Or it's, in essence, it's saying that this omega is a constant curvature. It's either the sphere, the hyperboloid, or just R d minus two. Then, with that, as long as the, you know that that in essence is enough to get you the uh, sort of Schwarzschild type of metric. So there are. I guess the first step, and I'm only going to sort of illustrate this, I'll, I'll sort of skip to four dimensions and do SO3, but it's in essence with so much symmetry, having that symmetry means you have killing vectors that satisfy the algebra of that symmetry group. You then choose, you sort of look at what the killing equation gives you, that starts to restrict down your metric, and the key there is the d minus 2, 
which means you've only got two dimensions left. Kappa minus mu over, oh sorry, it's r to the d minus three, not d minus two. Still haven't quite woken up yet, sorry. So it's kappa, so that tells you whether you've got a sphere or hyperboloid or flat, minus mu over r to the d minus three, so that would be your mass term. And then if you have a lambda, you get an additional piece in this potential. So the reason that we're interested in these spherically symmetric solutions is, of course, if you think about looking up into the sky, most, most things are sort of compact or localized. And so if we want to describe an astrophysical solution, it's reasonable as a very first step to think that it's spherically symmetric. So those of us who, who wrestle with um, analytic GR realize that when we're trying to find solutions, it's always symmetries that are the most important thing to take care of. So in... So I'm in, do, in talking here, I'm, I'm assuming that you have some knowledge of GR. Um, and the other thing I should say is it's reasonably obvious that my conventions are plus, minus, minus, minus. I often get grief for that. Um, I get told it's a phenomenologist's choice, and yet I got that from... Uh, where I did my PhD, which was, of course, the uh, relativity group at DAMP, so I can feel I can defend my choice of signature. Um, but it's also, I'm going to set C and H bar to 1. Okay, so what does it mean to have an SO3 symmetry group? It means we have three killing vectors. I'm going to just jot them down. So that is our, that's just what it means. It, you know, if you have a symmetry group, you've, it, it's a symmetry of the metric. So that means that if you take the Lie derivative of the metric with respect to these killing vectors, then it's zero. So once you have a symmetry of the metric, that sort of tells you about surfaces where it's not changing. So it's kind of saying if you... You know, when, when you have this closed form, here we've got three killing vectors, and it, there's, a, there's a theorem in geometry that says that then you have a surface of dimension less than or equal to three, which is sort of constant, if you like. So here, if you think about the sphere, you can sort of rotate your globe around, and the space-time doesn't change. So that's our two-dimensional surface. So we choose these theta and phi coordinates, which we're very familiar with from standard Cartesian geometry, to represent our spherical um, symmetry, our spheric, the spherical uh, surfaces on which the metric doesn't change. And so the fact that this, you have these uh, equations for each of these killing vectors starts to tell you a lot about the metric. You find that a lot of these off-diagonal terms are zero. 
You also have that the metric does not depend on the azimuthal angle. And unless you're looking at G phi phi, you see that essentially the metric has very little dependence on the angles, and the only dependence it has is what it needs to have for that constant curvature space. So from our symmetry, which is a lot of symmetry, it's a big assumption, we've now got the metric down. Sorry, someone was asking. Do we have, do we have three killing vectors for, an, for a spherical symmetry? In, in is it for the spatial dimensions or for the... For D space time, okay. yeah. So, but then... So it's three spatial dimensions. Three spatial dimensions. Mm -hmm. So why do we have three killing vectors instead of two on a, on a two-sphere? Because that's just the algebra of SO3. So the SO3, this is the SO3 algebra. And, and I guess, you know, that, that just is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then I suppose the theorem of statement Sorry? In the statement of the theorem, we have S of D minus 2. Yeah, but D is the dimension of space-time. And here we have S of 3. Yeah, so we're in 4. So D minus 1 instead of D minus 2. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, yeah OK. You're right. <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of thinking here of this D minus 2. Thank you. Yeah. It's funny, you know, I've said that each time, I said so different too. Okay, the question is about, is the yeah, near but, horizon limit solution also included? I'm, in that case, we don't have the, the factor R square in uh, front of the sphere metric. So I haven't got there yet. I, I mean, at the moment, I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm trying to prove that. Okay, but, but, but that is also the sort of exact solution to Einstein equations which has spherical symmetry. You mean when you're right, if you're in an, a, an extremal solution, or well, what? The, the, the bardeen horowitz limit of, of um, uh, uh, Sch Schwarzschild's Desiger solution. So which, tell me what that means, sorry. <laughs> well, this is a... a Exact solution obtained from from extreme black holes. Solution. Right, but usually if you go to an first of all, this there's no to get an extreme black hole, you need a charge. Yeah. Or a cosmological constant. So, but but you do you mean where you go to the limit where the two horizons merge? Yes. Right. Okay. There are two limits. One is when two horizons merge, yeah. and then the second limit is this is this uh, Bardeen uh, Horowitz limit when we go very close to horizon, but we still obtain, obtain uh, Right, but if you're going close to the horizon, you're always making, well, f initially you're making an approximation, right? But then the asymptotics will be different. Yeah. I think, I think, different. yeah, so. It's not asymptotically anything. Yeah. So, I mean, let me get to the point where at least I've demonstrated that, and then you can sort of, you know, look at what your actually what you're referring to. So, I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I don't think there's any, you know, I think these, these solutions are, are sort of the general solutions. Uh, but I mean, these near horizon limits are always in some approximation. And then the exact solution is usually you're taking different symmetries. Mm, yeah. But not, but only particular exact solutions, yeah? Because usually they're, usually with, with near horizon limits, you're going to a particular limit in which you've got a sort of product of two different spaces, right? Which is a sort of special case. It's very yeah. So... <coughs> Okey-doke, so where am I? 
So that symmetry That symmetry means that we've essentially been able to decompose the metric into this constant curvature piece and then in here a sort of tau rho, this, uh, the two remaining coordinates, one of which is time-like and one of which is space-like. So, so we've now said that this is, if we have that huge degree of symmetry, we're able to sort of peel off this subspace here. We give it an overall factor that depends on the remaining coordinates. And then we've got this two-dimensional metric out front. So that's what this large symmetry group gives us. And then we use the fact that a two-dimensional space is always conformally flat to write this as something proportional to d tau squared minus d rho squared. So that's just saying this is the most, we're picking coordinates to try and reduce the number of functions in our metric and so far we've now got it down to two. We've got it down to something multiplying this constant curvature space plus an additional function which is multiplying the remaining coordinates upon which the metric depends. So the difference with what Myers and Perry uh, were thinking about when they did their paper on general higher dimensional black holes is they put in the fact that it didn't de depend on this time-like coordinate, that it was only spatially dependent. But I'm saying you don't need to assume that. So with hindsight, I'm going to write these functions in a slight, what looks like a slightly odd format. And this is really just with the benefit of hindsight, having actually gone through the process, calculated the curvature, and then looked to see the pattern of the equations of motion that result. So here, this is writing that function C as a, as a function A with a particular exponent uh, uh, power, 2 over D minus 2, and then rather than having another function in front of the d tau squared minus d rho squared, I'm pulling out a bit of a, so this is minus d minus 3 over d minus 2, and then there's a remaining function nu. Now this is actually not physical degree of freedom of the metric, if you think about it, because I still have a conformal group of symmetry, gauge group here, I can change my coordinates in that two-dimensional space. So by the time we get to this point, we already know there's only one physical function in the metric, or at least we may not have the confidence to know it when we're going through it the first time, but it's sort of obvious with hindsight. Yeah. Mm. Connected to what, sorry? Yeah. Oh, I see. It's, the, it's not the same, but it's, it's a similar spirit where you fix exponents because there you're fixing things to make the equations of motion look nice. I mean, your, your factors. Because we have to, if we're doing curve vector compactification, Basically, we, we have nothing to fix the expectation 
the value of zero and two. So you have this flying exponent that, so the idea was to get from the compactification of uh, 26 dimensional uh, <laughs> gravity, get electromagnetism mm -hmm. to gravity. And then we get something that is moving. Yeah, forward. usually when you do these though, with these, with these choices of powers, you're doing it to make things either equations of motion simple, or in the case of the dilaton, you're, what you're often doing is choosing a factor that gives you a canonical normalization of the kinetic term when you come down to whatever dimension you're playing in. So usually you choose these, these, these numbers to, for, there's always some reason, right? In this case, the reason why I've chosen those numbers is because I want my Einstein equations to come out to be in a very amenable form for solving. So my Einstein equations, at the moment I've got no dilaton, I'm really looking at simple GR with a lambda, no dilaton. Sorry? Uh, so, in this case, it's just necessary to connect to the unit of gravity, the metric in a compactifier form. So, I'm saying here that my, my symmetry of the metric has allowed me to simplify it because I want to get rid of as much gauge freedom as possible. Write it. Okay, so I'm not writing them all down, I'm writing down the two I need. You've obviously, you know, there's a whole slew of Einstein equations. By my inverted commas here, all I mean is one of the angular or Cartesian or hyperbolic coordinates. Because by the fact that you've got this constant curvature space, you don't care which one. So this is a coordinate from the constant curvature space. So this is the reason I chose those funny uh, powers, because here I've now got everything which is sort of simplified down here. You see that this is just, I'm going to first start actually by working with the first equation, because that is actually directly integrable. And then my second equation looks like the wave operator acting on A. So, I, I mean, here you see that, you know, that it starts to look a lot simpler. So that's why those particular uh, powers were chosen. So if I label these one and two, from one, 
you can see that actually because this vanishes, you've got, if I multiply by a and divide by d plus or minus a, I can actually integrate that up. So I can integrate up that, that both set of equations, because there's two here for the plus and minus sign. And I see that this new function, the one that I claimed was gauge, is determined by a derivative of a, but here it's, this is the derivative with respect to tau plus rho. And it, I've got an arbitrary function there of tau minus rho. And here, it's the derivative with respect to tau minus rho. And I've got an arbitrary function of tau plus rho. And what this means is, this tells me that my a function is a function of some arbitrary function of tau plus rho plus an arbitrary function of tau minus rho. So if I put this form into those, um, this is, if you like, a consistency integration, then these equations will be satisfied and that's the general form that satisfies those equations. And so from this, I get that e to the 2 nu is actually, well, proportional, strictly speaking, to f prime, g prime, a prime, but it turns out that Constant of proportionality is not relevant, so I'm just going to set it equal to. So that's already, yeah. Uh, did this take log a plus a? Uh, these functions g, why are they tau minus two? Sorry, the function? Uh, these functions g and f, small g and small f. Yeah. Why are these tau minus two? So here, this is, I've got this first equation by integrating this equation at once, with but it's d plus a squared, so it's the second derivative of a with respect to tau plus rho, is equal to the first derivative of nu with respect to tau plus rho, and the first derivative of a with respect to tau plus rho. So you can see if I divide by d, d a, yeah, that's where my log comes from. But because I'm integrating with respect to t plus rho, I have to add an arbitrary function of t minus rho. So just think about it that <laughs> if you have, you know, I, I can, if you thought of it, may, maybe it would have been easier if I'd put u and v, yeah? So in essence, I'm integrating uh, avv over av, which gives me log av. And then that gives me two new, but then because u is an independent, if you like, variable, I have to add an arbitrary function of u. So that's why these crop up. Because in the first case, I'm integrating with respect to tau plus rho. And in the second case, I'm integrating with respect to tau minus rho. So I have to have these arbitrary functions. And then from here, you see that the those arbitrary functions are sort of related to the logs of these f primed and g primed. So that, that's kind of how you see it.
So then I go back to the second equation because now I know, at least um, implicitly, I know the form that my function A takes. So I'm going to rearrange it so that the, I'm looking at what a double dot minus a double prime is. So a double dot minus a double primed, I put in this form of a, and I end up with this. And then that equals to something involving lambda and something involving the curvature of that extra space. But my e to the 2 nu also has f prime g prime in it. So here we've got this e to the 2 nu. So I can cancel off those f prime g primes, and then I have purely an equation for a. So I can integrate So when I integrate that equation for a double primed, I find I have to add a constant of integration. So I add this mu in at that point. So hopefully you can kind of see where, where these things are coming from. I've introduced this just for convenience because I'm obviously aiming at a particular expression we can sort of see the f beginning to emerge, that f of r. So actually, at this point, strictly speaking, you might be able to integrate that function and find out what a is. But you don't necessarily have to because... If I go back to the expression in the middle of that top middle board, um, I sort of see A multiplying that d omega squared piece. So I'm going to choose now a coordinate So I'm going to choose A, essentially, as a coordinate. And that is really saying I'm choosing an aerial gauge. So now my a primed, I can write as almost f of r. So now I'm almost there. If I look at what r is, dr
So my dr is proportional to df plus dg. So this suggests if I take the other linearly independent combination of f and g, f minus g, then If I take that combination, so I'm sort of stepping towards the final result here, I see that dt squared minus dr squared on f squared is proportional to df dg. But if I look at the expression in my metric, which was e to the 2 nu, <coughs> Then what I, my general metric, which I wrote in the middle of that top middle board, boils down to f dt squared minus dr squared on f. So in other words, from just that strong, like in, let's say, spherical symmetry group, Having that alone, in essence, damps out, it, you know, this, um, de the dependence on the two of the coordinates, tau and rho, it's saying that really that dependence can be boiled down into a dependence on a single function of, well, a spatial version of the, um, the two remaining coordinates in the geometry. So it's, uh, it's, it's sort of nice that, you know, in essence, this is, this is showing you the power of symmetry in GR, saying if you have a lot of symmetry, it can really restrict the freedom in the solutions that you can have. Yeah, I was just clearing up yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so going back to, to those solutions, which I yeah. seem to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to know, and uh, that they would correspond to a very degenerate case. Yeah. When this uh, bracket, when, when in this expression for A prime, yeah. the bracket on the right-hand side is identically zero. Zero. For mm -hmm. A being constant. Yeah. And that would mean That's usually that maybe, a maybe in this calculation, this case is just excluded. Because then this, this equation... Also, also here, right? Yeah, so, so actually, when we first did this, it was very specific. It wasn't a general dimension. It was for um, five dimensions, ADS, brain worlds. This was back in the time of brain worlds. Mm -hmm. So here, this is like the generic case. If 
but we also commented on two special cases where there were certain, uh, uh, I guess it's possible one of your cases is hidden in there where there's a sort of degeneracy, something vanishes. So I, I guess I could go back and, and check that, but this is kind of the generic case. So in other words, sort of imagining that we're, you know, I guess I'd have to sort of think about what's the right mathematical way to phrase this. But yes, when we first did this, we did, there were, there were some special cases. Yeah, I guess, um, which is again, that's, if you like, that's down to a choice of mu, yeah? So it's saying that uh, if you're looking for the general solution, right, you would have a general integration parameter. So it's true, I guess, you're, you're absolutely right, you could always choose a specific mu such that that vanished, but I, that would then be not a generic solution. It's not saying that it's not a, none of these are saying there isn't a solution. This is more about what is the most general solution under this circumstance. So, but, um, but you've raised a good point, so I'd have to go back, you know, and take a look, also remind myself of these special cases that we did. Um, but also, you know, again, it's, it's more, I think, of a statement about the genericity of it rather than saying certain things are not allowed because I think at the time when, you know, when you're looking for solutions, particularly in higher dimensions, I think it's quite easy to um, make an assumption very early on about the form of the solution, in which case it's not that what you get is not a solution, or a geometry in Einstein's equations. It's simply that it's not the most general geometry. So this is more about saying this is the most general geometry. But, um, yeah. Yeah, that's, those were some of the special cases where one of them was not, yeah. So there are, there are special cases, yeah, which I'm not. So, um, so I think that if one of F or G are constant, it's, you still get a solution, but it's, it's distinctive. Um, however, again, this is just the, general, the most generic case. What's the most general solution that you can have? Because, because you might imagine that by writing down the Schwarzschild solution, you're missing out some time dependence yeah, that could be there. But in fact, what this tells you is, nope, you're not missing on anything that as long as there's no other fields around, Schwarzschild really is all you can have with the SO3 symmetry. Yep. So, um, just wanted to make a few comments, and then we can have a very short comfort break. Um, so I think, you know, one comment is if you look at that form of F, which I've just helpfully deleted, so I'll just rewrite it again. Um, it's a sort of silly, trivial statement, but if lambda is positive and um, we are sort of, I guess, you know, if lambda's Lambda's positive, we get that mu, although I haven't proved this, but you can kind of see it, mu is sort of related to a mass parameter, then we need kappa
We need kappa equal to one to make sure that we get a horizon. It's sort of an obvious statement. But on the other hand, if lambda is negative, then we can have planar and hyperbolic black holes. So that's something that, again, is uh, a sort of well-known thing about doing black holes in ADS, that you have a lot more choice for the type of topology of black holes. <clears throat> And then more generally, if we break that SO uh, D minus <clears throat> one symmetry, then there's a lot more possibilities. So the, the real key to having that, that argument, which tells you this is the only metric you can have with those symmetries, sort of boils down to this integrability condition. The moment you break the SO3 symmetry, that starts to introduce extra fields, which sort of come in because you've now got less symmetry. So if you like, you're parameterizing the way in which you've broken the symmetry. Roughly speaking, <laughs> what happens is you start to get a right-hand side here. It doesn't mean you don't find solutions. It just means that you tend to start having to make an ansatz for your metric to find a solution. So, um, And so what that approximately means is it's a lot harder to prove uniqueness when you've got these more general solutions. So the simplest way of breaking that SOD minus 1 symmetry is to include uh, rotation. So you break down to, say, a U1 subgroup, at least in three dimensions. So I just want to... Uh-huh. That also destroys that. Okay. <laughs> but if we, could we make something like minimal coupling for gravity? So if you have to couple matter in a specific way to preserve the rotation of symmetry, right? So could we, does the minimal coupling prescription fall? I, I, I thought I read that in that last time. I think it depends. So if you introduce a scalar field, for example, that breaks that integrability argument. So you then have an extra degree of freedom. And you will, again, when you say making an assumption, that's sort of like the equivalent of setting an ansatz, right? It's saying that you're, in order, you know, what you've, there isn't this, this is the most general solution type of statement. So again, you have to make an ansatz. So in essence, I think if you, if you add a scalar field, what effectively you're now saying is there could be time dependence, if you like. And physically, you might think of that as being, if I have a scalar field, well, maybe that scalar field is doing something, and it has energy momentum. And so if it has energy momentum, some of that could fall into the black hole in which case the black hole would grow. That would be, I'm just giving a, a very hand-waving argument as to why adding an extra field now adds extra degrees of freedom. All this tells you is about what things black holes will settle down to. So Myers and Perry 
uh, if you like, um, I think not the first people to do, um, were they the first people really to do higher dimensional black holes? They were certainly the first people to do this in a, in a very systematic way and to add rotation. So if you break this spherical symmetry, then there's really a lot of possibilities, but rotation is the simplest one. And one of the interesting things about rotation in higher dimensions is that uh, you, get, you start to pick up extra quantum numbers, if you like. So in other words, extra degrees of freedom or parameters for the metric. And so Myers and Perry derived this in a very systematic way. So you can think of this intuitively as it, for the, your spatial directions, you kind of split them into pairs so that you decompose your spatial directions into a set of mutually orthogonal two planes. And then a generic rotation is composed of sort of a set of these rotations in the individual two planes. And if you've got an odd number of spatial directions, there's an additional, if you like, axis that you, you first choose. So, So I'm going to refer you to the original Myers-Perry paper for the sort of absolutely <clears throat> general expression. But a simplest example is how you would generalize rotation, just a single rotation, uh, which we usually parameterize by A in our metric. So here we have So mu is related to m, just these are definitions of the parameters, and again Myers and Perry, by analyzing, they were doing this in vacuum of course, the asymptotic behavior of the metric related the mass to this mu parameter. Oh, and I haven't said what sigma is, have I? Oh, 
Yep, sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Sorry. About that. No, because this is minus mu here. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you set if you set um, a to zero, you'll see that this becomes r to the d minus three. So you'd have one minus mu over r to the d minus three, which would be your Schwarzschild in general dimensions. So that's the uh, remaining. Uh, so this the first. This is, if you like, this is very much like Kerr with just a few d sprinkled around. But this is then the remaining d minus 4 dimensions, yeah. So, I mean, in this case, uh, what they've sort of split, uh, they've pulled off an SO3 bit, if you like, where there's rotation. And then they've left. They've sort of split it into r sine theta, r cos theta. So they've sort of split the space time into a bit that's rotating and then the rest that c kind of comes along for the ride. So, um, so I think um, I was told I should give a break. <laughs> so, um, But it's up to you. What do you think? Yes, yes, is a good time. Yeah, so just in case, five minute break. Um, gives me time to clean the boards and to figure out where I'm going to get to. If capital D is the dimension of space time. Yes. Okay, then look at this F. Yep. You again put D, D minus, minus two, two again. Cent. Yes, oh. okay. Yeah. So check your. Yeah. No. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I keep putting D minus two instead of, someone pointed out, I put.